was Tuesday the 19th of May 1987 and New Zealand Flight 24 had stopped for refuelling at Nandi Airport on its way between Narita Airport and Auckland. On board the 747 was 105 passengers, mostly Japanese tourists and 24 crew. They were all about to go through a day they would never forget. Shortly after landing, the aircraft was boarded by Fijian Indian Amjad Ali at 7.15 a.m. Ali worked for Nandi Airport Terminal Services and carried the refuelling documentation. There was nothing untoward him being on the aircraft that morning. He made his way to the cockpit and then the whole tenor changed in the blink of an eye. I am here to blow you up. My life is in danger. They are going to kill me. He then revealed he was packing six sticks of dynamite. Exactly the same ones depicted in cartoons. One of which was in his hand. The other five were strapped to his body. And Ali was a chain smoker. One can only imagine what was going through the crew and passengers' minds at this stage. Our demands and conditions are very clear, and we will not go back on them, no matter what happens. Using the aircraft's radio, Ali issued his demands, the chief one being the release of the recently deposed PM, Timothy Bavaradra, and his cabinet held under house arrest five days previous as a result of a recent military coup led by Sitavini Rambuka. His other demands were that the aircraft was flown to Libya or Australia. Ali told the crew once they got into the air, he had the necessary flight plans to get the plane to Tripoli. As the likelihood of these demands being met increasingly looked dim, he then wanted to be given asylum in New Zealand. Commanded the door to the cockpit was closed, leaving just him, Captain Graham Gleeson, Flight Engineer Graham Walsh and First Officer Michael McKay. Gleeson had a military background, having flown Vulcan bombers for the RAF. The other 105 passengers and 21 crew took the opportunity to exit the aircraft and extricate themselves from the hijacking. Ali continued to use the aircraft's radio to talk to officials in both Fiji and at Air New Zealand HQ in Auckland, as well as to his family. Just three crew remained on NZ-24. Meanwhile, the New Zealand SAS were put on alert and an aircraft readied to attempt to bring an armed end to the situation if negotiations failed. That wouldn't be necessary. The crew took matters into their own hands. At one o'clock, around five hours into the hijacking, Flight engineer Graham Walsh hit Arley over the head with a full bottle of whiskey whilst he sat in the captain's seat talking to negotiators. The three crew then leapt all over Arley and subdued him. This wasn't the end of the story, not by a long shot. Arley wasn't actually charged for the hijacking. He was given a suspended sentence only, one for taking explosives onto a plane. Recently Ali explained the hijacking was a spur of the moment event. Sorry buddy, unless you can grab explosives from the Nandi duty free, the whole thing reeks of pre-planning. Also, who finds it necessary to carry flight maps to Libya in their top pocket? Still, at the time, Fiji had way bigger fish to fry in terms of the military coup. If Ali was to be found guilty, then virtually the entire army could be facing imprisonment. 
Their justice system at the time was in tatters. What's more, Ali went on to later run for Fijian parliament under the Labour ticket, got elected and even became Minister of Education, served in parliament until 2009. And what was the reaction in New Zealand? This is where it gets, to my mind, rather murky. In 2009, Ali was granted residency in New Zealand. With his record, this shouldn't be possible, unless the party concerned was given a ministerial exemption. Let's take a look at the restrictions that prohibit an individual becoming a New Zealand resident. Apparently, the ministerial OK that would be required under these circumstances didn't happen. So how was he able to become a New Zealand resident? Being a hijacker who threatened to blow up a New Zealand aircraft in an act of politically motivated terrorism should have automatically prevented him becoming a New Zealand resident and even getting to first base. Merely having relatives in New Zealand isn't a given. If threatening to blow up and kill people on a state-run airline wasn't a security threat, then what the hell is? Regardless of the cause. Now we need to deal with Air New Zealand abandoning their own published terms of carriage. Time to read them as well, folks. I don't think I'm drawing a long bow here in the presumption hopping on a flight with explosives strapped to one's body puts the aircraft and other persons at risk. It was later established the fuse on his explosives were in the range of 6 to 7 seconds. Were one to go off, even mistakenly, this is what would have been the likely situation. I am here to blow you up. 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 In an amazing turn the other cheek decision, in New Zealand has consistently turned a blind eye to Ali travelling with them between Auckland and Nandy and return. When asked, how can you permit the hijack of one of your aircraft on board another Air New Zealand flight, Air New Zealand simply plays the privacy card. This is the very airline that in 2019 claimed it was cracking down on unruly behaviour by passengers, issuing five-year bans for punters getting pissed and obnoxious. The same airline that banned a Nelson lawyer for a year after a verbal altercation in one of their ritzy Coru lounges, tossed a couple off a flight for not listening to the pre-flight safety spiel. Asking a passenger if they're comfortable sitting next door to an emergency exit is one thing. Asking if they're comfortable sitting next door to a hijacker, another. Why the exemption to their policy? No lifetime ban. That would seem entirely reasonable to most people. Similarly, why didn't civil aviation intervene here? In 2020, a person checking into Whangarei Airport made a bad joke about his family member travelling with him having a bomb in his bag. This relatively trivial matter, one in which his lawyer described the guy as being a bloody idiot, ended up in court. Amjad Ali hijacked a New Zealand plane in transit. Thus, his crime falls into the jurisdiction of New Zealand civil aviation. The moment he touched down into New Zealand, he should have been arrested. Auckland Airport also has the power to ban him as well. 
IATA, in New Zealand Engineers Union, where were they? All deaf, dumb and blind. If anyone should have punished Ali, it should have been Air New Zealand, and New Zealand full stop. You see, every time passengers from flight NZ-24 now get onto an aircraft, I'm sure the trauma of that day is relived. Their need for justice have never been met and are being ignored. It is simply not good enough for officials to hide behind privacy in cases of this nature. I am here to blow you up. Why have the New Zealand government, Air New Zealand and civil aviation place Ali's need for individual rights above those pertaining to national and aviation security? Why have they gone against their own rules? What do you think? Put your comments in below. In a cool way to end this video, you see that bottle of whiskey? It remains a souvenir to the events of the 19th of May 1987, even to this day. <coughs> Thanks for popping by. I'll see you again shortly. Bye for now.